Welcome everyone to a lovely Tuesday night and thanks for tuning in to our master talk tonight. And so, um, yeah, excited to have everyone on board to tonight's our 3D master talk presented and hosted by AIT. And so just really appreciate everyone's time as well for, you know, being after hours, tuning in and learning a bit about some exciting news in 3D. Hopefully everyone's, you know, that's here tuning in, probably is a bit interested as well into, you know, thinking about what is 3D, how does 3D work and possibly contemplating 3D as a possible career path, right? And it's more just about seeing what's it like in the world of 3D, what's happening and what's it like as like a work in the industry. So um, yeah, it should be a very fun and exciting night tonight and see some cool, exciting work from two very special guests that we have that we'll introduce you to soon. But before we get started, I just want to start off by acknowledging the First Nations people, right? And we want to recognize the Gadigal of the Aurora Nation as the traditional cust custodians of this land where we are presenting from. We are based in Ultimo, and so the Gadigal of the Aurora Nation are the traditional custodians of this land. So we just want to pay our respects to the elders, past and present, and also want to welcome any First Nations people that are also here with us today. So yeah, without further ado, I just want to welcome everyone to tonight's talk. We've got two very special guests, right? and I'll introduce them to sort of come on camera in a second. But um, we've got two 3D artists, or even three, we've got a third one popped in. And so uh, we've got three very special guests today. They come from a uh, studio called Giraffic, right? And so they specialize in uh, virtual production and 3D art for the broadcasting industry. Now, some of you may or may not watch sport or have seen TV. I don't know, like, you know, now they will watch YouTube as well. But um, yeah, Giraffic is one of those companies that focus on a lot of the 3D effects and 3D visualizations that you see on the sports shows and uh, live news shows as well. So just a quick blurb summary of um, Giraffic, right? And I just, they specialize in what we call Viz RT. RT, is that real-time? Viz visualization real-time products and workflows. And they have over 30 years of industry experience in the broadcast business so they've been around in the tv space for a long time chances are you've probably seen some of their work and we've got three very special guests today we've got hugh guest who is the virtual production specialist at giraffic virtual production is a very big buzzword right now a lot of the industry is moving into virtual production so it would be really cool to see what Hugh has to share with us today and how the land of virtual production works. We also have Aiden Wilson, who is a technical artist. And so, you know, in the world of 3D, there is 3D artists, and then there's also technical artists, which is a much more technical 3D artist, right? And so from like a career perspective, a lot of us want to jump into art or maybe want to do something technical. And knowing this role, the existence of the technical artists and what they do should be very exciting to see. And Aiden's going to show us what's it like to work as a technical artist as well. And so last but not least, we also have Victor Limsilla, who's the art lead and project manager at Giraffic. And yeah, he'll be tuning in as well and share with us maybe some insights into how things work in Giraffic. But overall, it should be a very exciting night tonight in terms of, yeah, seeing what it's like to work in the 3D industry shown by some experts in our field. So yeah, just want to say welcome, Hugh, Aiden, and Wilson, uh, and, and Victor. And yeah, I'll probably like give you guys the floor and... Yeah, take us away. Okay. Hi there, everybody. Um, I'm Hugh. I'm the virtual production specialist at Giraffic. Um, and we are going to be covering um, some of the ways that 3D art is used in a live context. So whether that be virtual production, whether that be broadcast. Um, because it's, it's one thing to use 3D art to make beautiful pieces of art, but it's another thing to use 3D art to create something that moves, that flows, that incorporates data that is actively useful. And so that's the kind of thing that, um, that's the kind of thing that we do um, 
at Jurassic. So a little primer on me, um, I started as a broadcast engineer, so somebody who mainly plugs in cables, um, and then over the course of the past three years have taught myself the Unreal Engine um, in order to use it in our broadcast workflows. Um, and so Aiden, if you'd like to introduce yourself as well. Hello everyone, my name is Aiden. Um, I actually started out in the film industry. I have a bachelor's degree in both film and animation. Um, uh, I am a tech artist, so what that is, is you sort of have an artist that creates 3D assets and whatnot, and you have programmers that program stuff, and so tech art fits right in the middle between those two things and sort of bridges that gap. Um, I've worked on plenty of uh, TV and film, uh, projects, uh, both in virtual production and traditional, uh, and now I'm working at Giraffic doing all sorts of uh, experimental uh, bits and bobs. And cool, Victor, if you just want to introduce yourself quickly as well. Yep. Meet myself. Cool. Hi, I'm Victor. I'm Adli and the project manager here at Giraffic. Uh, and what I'm, uh, my background is actually uh, came from AIT. I was an AIT alumni. I started out in animation and uh, video games art, and then started working in the AR VR industry, and then joined Giraffic later on, uh, specializing in character art and the uh, sculpting side, so more on the uh, art asset side of things, and then move into uh, creating virtual space. So uh, with today, uh, joining what we have uh, within Giraffic is we want to take you guys to the different industry that uh, you guys come into um, 3D or any doubt other work, especially now we are using Unreal Engine, which is traditionally a game engine. And now we are adapting it to an uh, entirely different three, uh, workflow and how it did. So today, hopefully, we'll show, be able to show you like different pathway that you can take uh, in, into the journey in this really exciting time, new technology as well. Yep. Uh, I think I'll hand it over to you, Hugh. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm just going to show um some stuff some of the stuff that we do at Giraffic. so i'm sure you've heard virtual production as a buzzword it's all the hot topic at the moment um there's a lot of excitement around it as well um but ultimately when you boil it down to a practical sense virtual production is the um virtual production is the process of using real-time 3D engines in order to incorporate them into various forms of media. So in our case, we use virtual production a lot in the context of live broadcast. Um, so everything that we do is based on a simple illusion. The idea is that if you have a real world camera and a virtual in-engine camera in a 3D rendering engine, and you match them up perfectly, then images from one can be overlaid on top of the other in order to create a composite image from those two cameras. And so that's a little bit hard to explain. So let's show some examples. So um, the entire broadcast industry has been starting to move towards Unreal Engine 4 and eventually 5 in order to utilize state-of-the-art, um, real-time 3D graphics in live broadcast. Um, the broadcast industry and has actually been doing something similar to virtual production for decades, really. Um, there are old ads for, um, for ancient camera tracking systems to do virtual sets for news readers, and that has existed for decades, but um, with the advent of video game engines and increased rendering power, all of a sudden we've start to see a shift away from um, the traditional players in the broadcast space into um, new players, specifically Epic and Unreal, who have made a huge push to um, 
get their technology working in broadcast, TV, um, and film. And so you can see these are the kinds of shots that we make for our clients. Uh, and all of this is running um, in real time. Uh, in Australia, we have to uh, maintain a frame rate of 50 frames per second. So everything here is not only good looking, but made to be rigorously optimized for the best possible results. So this project that I'm showing here is for uh, Cheez-It, is for Cheez-It, which is an American company, maker of snacks. Um, and we produced not only the visuals for them, but we also produced the backend tool set that they used um, to film uh, their shot, uh, to film their ad against our backdrop. So as you can see, these are some of the tools that we have here. Um, so Unreal Engine allows us to um, do many more things than we're traditionally able to. It allows us to build custom tools that we can use to visualize our shoots, that we can use to pre-plan um, pre our broadcast and pre-plan our filming solutions um, because of its nature. Um, when Aiden takes over, he'll show you some of the toys that we use and some of the experiments that we've been doing, just because um, this new world is so versatile. Some more cheese it. And so this kind of shot is the bread and butter of what we do in broadcast. This is running in real time. Uh, this was recorded right off um, the camera. Uh, and so you can see this is a completely virtual set. Um, our talent here is just standing on a green screen. Um, and we are able to bring data, um, bring data in, in this case, weather data that we can use to visualize, um, that we can use to visualize whatever we want, um, be it weather data, sports data, um, just pretty pictures. Um, uh, and we also have graphics like this. This is another example of a kind of augmented reality graphic that we'd make for, um, for a sports stadium or perhaps elections. Uh, this is an example. This one actually went to air. This is a um, graphic that we created for the Chilean elections. So um, not only did we have to create the art asset itself within Unreal, but we also had to implement systems for um, passing data um, from, that we were receiving from election officials in order to display them dynamically on screen. We also have to make tool sets. So this is a virtual set and you can see that um, we build tools that allow elements of this virtual set to be toggled on and off um, for different things to be changed, um, for colors of lights to be changed. And this is all the kind of in-depth control that you need when you are working in a live broadcast space. Um, also, we work with so-called flat graphics, which are our bread and butter, uh, the kind of graphics which display information cleanly and efficiently. But you can also give them a little bit of flair as well. So this is the kind of um, work that we do in the broadcast industry. It's not just beautiful, but it's also highly technical. Uh, it involves um, visual programming. It involves integration of data all sorts of things. And the end result is something like this. Talent in a completely virtual set with an augmented reality graphic in front of them. And so in broadcast, we kind of have all the pro major problems of film VFX production and all the major problems of sports broadcast. Um, we have to uh, create graphics that look great because now the standards are getting much, much higher. We need to keep them performance and we need to turn them around quite quickly so that they can be used um, live on the day. And so you can see um, all, all of this work towards creating graphics that are not just uh, visually pleasing, 
but also have uh, that are controllable, that are dynamic, um, that can be used for, um, that can be used in real time and that can be built in such a way that we are able to, um, that we are able to run shows um, and adapt to the twists and turns that might come our way. And so, yeah, so this is what, this is our particular rendition of what virtual production means. For us, virtual production is, um, is a combination of art and tool sets all coming together to produce, um, to produce results that weren't even thinkable like a handful of years ago. The broadcast industry um, is full of old school solutions. Um, it's very resist it's very hesitant to change. And so for um, players like Unreal to come along and show people what's possible in real time um, and to get these traditionally conservative um, and resistant to change houses, to come forward and start embracing it, to start getting excited um, for the possibilities of, um, of this new world of virtual production is really quite exciting. Um, and so I'm going to hand over to Aiden now, who's going to show you uh, some of the stuff that we've been talking about, some of the tracking technologies that we're using to, um, to create these effects. Um. Thank you, Hugh. <clears throat> All right, hopefully everyone can see my camera because I'm going to move it. Uh, so as Hugh said, uh, tracking and the ability to match the virtual and the real is very important. So in my tiny office, I have installed uh, for this one OptiTrack system. So that's these cameras up here. And then there's another two, one behind this web. Uh, this is actually a cinema camera, not a webcam. Uh, and then one in the corner there. So... What I'm going to show you is how this works and set it up for a demonstration because a demonstration is always nicer than watching a video. No offense, you. <laughs> so what we have with those cameras is these things. Uh, you've probably seen them. Um, so this is what's called a retro reflector. So this bounces light directly back at, oh, that's out of focus, directly back at where the light was shot out from. So you see these in cat eyes on the road, as well as like high-vis vests and stuff like that. So all of these cameras, um, which I've got one right here. So all of these cameras have uh, infrared lights around the outside as a ring light. Um, now infrared is invisible to human, but uh, is visible to cameras. That's why it probably showed up as a bit of a red glow. Um, so what that does is these will then bounce that infrared light directly back at the source, which is the camera in this case. So I will share my screen. Like so, and so here we go. So all these cameras, I hope that's visible. Um, all these cameras are infrared cameras. So they're black and white. These are usually what you see for like night vision mode in a camera, uh, in a movie, sorry. So as we can see, here is that retro reflector and it glows really bright because obviously it's reflecting all of that infrared light back at the camera. So we get a really bright glowing uh, little tracking ball. So I'm going to switch that back to, so obviously our program just simply sorts out um, what is and isn't the balls. So we just get those. And so what that means, I'm going to hide that for a second, is just here we have, uh, it's bouncing in and out a bit, but here is that ball being tracked because all these cameras are calibrated. So because I can... It is being seen by at least two cameras. Oh, uh, that means it can be tracked. So as I move it around in space, all of these cameras follow it around and can calculate its position in 3D. Now, if I add a few more markers to it, which is what that thing is I threw on the floor, here we go, we can track not just position, but we can also track rotation. So here we have uh, this object. It just looks like some it's just you need a very unique looking object but what that gives us is i can now move this object left right back forward uh, spin it around you know and this gets tracked because simply by triangulating these dots 
I can move it around and it gets tracked really well. So uh, we have devices like this. Um, this is called a passive tracking system. You can also have active systems, which these are replaced with lights, blinking lights. Um, and you can have all, sort of, all sorts of different tracking systems, but this is one of the ones we use. And so this can track objects. So now we can pop over into Unreal and I'll give you a demo of what we do with this. So in Unreal here, I'm just going to move my... There we go. All right, so in Unreal, so we're gonna start with the uh, ALS system. This is uh, free on the Epic Marketplace. This is just a basic game system. So if I hit play, I can run around. So this has already got a heap of animations and stuff in it. And so we're gonna use this as a base. Instead of uh, mocap, basically, I will be using this as an animation source. Now, on top of that, we then have a camera here. As you can see, it's sort of jiggling a bit. And so what that is, is we're receiving the data just here from Opti the uh, motive it's called is the software OptiTrack runs. And so as I pick this up and move it around and turn it and whatnot, we now have a camera in Unreal that is replicating the movements of this. Like that. So that's where it starts. Now I'm going to get my unpaid assistant's help. Um, all right, so what we're going to do with this uh, is we're quickly, we are going to remake National Treasures uh, because why not? So what we're going to do is we're going to combine both the camera and the character at once, and I'm going to make, do a bit of previs. Um, you know, previs is helpful for film, it's helpful for animations, it's really helpful for everything. Um, and these are the sort of tools, you know, uh, Hugh had shown, they do um, a system we use for previs for Cheez-Its, so, um, you know, this is the same vein. So if I hit play, what I have here is, all right, so I have up in the left corner, and I'm gonna make it bigger, so you can see, I have somewhere here, I need to figure out where it's pointing. Where is it pointing? Could you please move into the camera view? Oh, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna try my very hardest to do a um, camera move with a tiny little tracking marker while uh, my character here walks around the corner. And the, all this is happening live, you know? We're just using an Xbox controller. All right. Just like that. And so, you know, that took me three seconds. You know, we're just using an Xbox controller. I could replace this with a phone or a Vive or something like that, a VR headset. Um, and then the beauty of Unreal is what we can do is we can use what's called Take Recorder. So Take Recorder lets us record uh, data, not video, but data. So what we're going to do is we're going to record the camera's position and the character's animation as it's created so that we can then play that back later and fine tune it. So I'm going to hit play, I'm going to hit record, I'm going to hit full screen, and we're going to try and make a scene here. Alrighty. Right, and then we hit escape. And so the beauty of Take Recorder is that we can then play that back. And so remember, we're not playing back the video. We didn't record a video. We recorded the data of what the characters are moving. So I can scrub through it, and here we can see our character here moving around back and forward. And this is all new animation, right? This isn't previous animation. We're Because Unreal's a game engine, we've blended various animations together. Uh, and we have our camera here that's been tracked. And so I can, you know, we've still got our track camera here. That's the tracked one. This gray one here is the previous camera that we did. And so I can come through and if I hit that and that, then we can actually watch back. I'll hide this camera. And I can actually watch back the thing we just made. So, and then I can come through here, and here's the benefit, is I can then start editing it. So, if I find the camera, I don't even know where the camera, there it is. You know, I can grab the camera, and I could change the focal length, for example. If we say we want 50 mil, you know, I can add animation on top of this, I can change our focus, you know, and so we can fine-tune this, and then we've got 
pretty much a complete cinematic ready uh, to use for, you know, uh, the next step, you know, we can, you know, now we have uh, directions for actors, we have, we know what we need in an environment, you know, um, we know what camera moves we want. And so all this is pre-planned out and we did that all in, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes uh, in front of you guys with nothing more than an Xbox controller, basically, and a tracking system. So hopefully you enjoyed that. I'm sure you probably have questions. So um, do feel free to ask them away in the chat. I uh, believe we have some Q&A afterwards uh, to answer them. Yeah, cool. Um, and as hard as it is to follow that demo up, because like if that's your first time seeing like live tracking stuff, live tracking stuff is awesome. Um, and now we can finally show you how all of that comes together for an actual real world broadcast. So this is an actual broadcast from TVNZ. And here is it working in practice. This is an entirely virtual set designed for TVNZ. And it's all being done in real time. A fact that I can show you right here, because here it is. This is that set um, from before. And once we take all of that camera tracking technology, once we take all of that stuff, we bring it on site, and then we can create a set completely out of nothing. A set that not only runs in real time, but is controllable in real time. So we have controls for weather. We can change the weather instantly. We can change the time of day. And we can even put things in front or behind of the talents. And so this is the kind of thing that is start that has been around for ages in broadcast, but now is coming into a whole new world with the advent of virtual production and the rise of Unreal. Um, and so it's a really exciting time to be getting into broadcast because this kind of standard of 3D art is starting to come to the forefront and is starting to be um, shown and rolled out to broadcast houses all over the world. So um, it is a really exciting time to start to get into virtual production. And that's everything we have to show for you. I believe we have Q&A now for another 10, 15 minutes. Wow, that is awesome. Thanks so much, you, and thanks so much, Aiden, for the showcase, right? And I hope, hopefully everyone, you know, learn a thing or two about now what it's like and how things operate in the sort of broadcast space in terms of technical art really it was great to sort of show the sort of markers aid and then just showing it in real time i thought was really like eye-opening right and then also like talking us through the virtual production side of things where it's like a virtual room nowadays here that was a really great insight as well so um yeah we're gonna have like 15 minutes of uh, Q and A, right? And so if you have any questions, by the way, that you'd like to ask uh, Hugh and Aiden, definitely throw it in the chat. We're gonna collect all the questions and hopefully get them answered. So if there's anything that you've ever wanted to learn about 3D and stuff, now's a good time to ask. But I'll start off with a few questions myself, but um, in terms of maybe throw it to start off with you, Aiden, like you showed us those marker systems, which is really cool. And so, Essentially what that is, is you then attach them to the real cameras when you work with the live broadcasting, like, cause you got those dots, right? And so what does the virtual camera usually look like when you're like doing it on set? What do you attach them to? Oh, they, um, it depends on the tracking system. We have, um, we usually use this system called Red Spy or Mosis, um, and that works inside out. So instead of having these reflective dots on the cameras, uh, we have these on the roof, uh, and then you have one camera mounted looking up on the broadcast camera with the IR lights. And so that's usually called a star tracker because it maps the all the dots on the roof because they're just placed randomly and can work out its location and rotation based on that star map. Um, and that's the most common one we use. But um, like this OptiTrack, the exact one I have here was used on things like Mandalorian and all that. And usually it is just a weird shape like this, um, just so there's a lot of variation to it. And then usually that's mounted just above the lens on the camera. That's 
Excellent. And then there, there will mm. also be a processing box um, mm. stapled somewhere just to actually collect all of that data and send it to your rendering engine. Yeah, mm. so um, mine's actually just sitting in the corner there. Um, all the cameras feed into that, and then that feeds into your computer. As Well, what's an instance that you can remember, like the max dots that you've ever had to handle in one scene? Um, look... Uh, when you're doing mocap, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you have all the dots on your body. Mm -hmm. uh, a standard mocap marker set is 48 per person, and mm -hmm. I've done four people at a time. Oh, wow. That's... So the, the mm -hmm. program, and it can handle, like if I cover a marker, mm -hmm. um, so long as it can see the others, it does a really good job guessing. It'll mm -hmm. be like, oh, this marker that's disappeared was traveling this direction at this speed, so it must be here. And so mm -hmm. it, the program's really good at, like, you know, you can have people piling up on each other, hugging each other, and it tracks all of it just fine. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. Four people. And this is all now, like, in Unreal Engine captured. Yep. In so, yeah, yeah. So we tracked four people and a camera, and they basically mm. acted out a scene in live, like a um, mm. like a traditional film, except we weren't actually filming anything. It was just all being done in engine. Yeah. And how is tracking these days? Because, like, back in the days, mocap data, like, you mocap, then there's a lot of cleaning, and there's a lot of, like... Uh, how, <laughs> how, how long do you want to spend cleaning it up? <laughs> um, so yeah, it's it it is heavily dependent on what tracking system you use. Mm. Um, if you use something like the OptiTrack that we've got there, it can be really really good. There are others that now that are AI based that don't even need trackers. But there's also like um, people making sort of like prosumer grade motion tracking suits. Like um, Rococo is one that comes to mind that makes a really affordable full body tracking suit that um, gives you pretty good animation. That if you wanted to clean it up um in the back end you would still need to do uh but the ceiling for the technology has started to come down a lot i think um, it's, it's um it's less clean up and more remapping so all of these systems use a defined skeleton but that not might not match the skeleton of your character um so the process is less you know fixing jitters and more transferring that animation data from the OptiTrack skeleton to your character's skeleton and mm -hmm. overcoming any issues with differences in, um, you know, sizes, heights, all that sort of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of these companies now also make a dedicated camera tracker. Um, OptiTrack's got one. It's like, it's a different, more expensive box. And these are tuned to be like the cleanest data possible because when you're live, like we are with broadcast, there is no time for cleanup, right? So mm -hmm. we just need the best possible data right then and there. So that's why a lot of companies, even Vive, I think, um, mm -hmm. the VR maker, um, has a like camera-specific tracker now. Yeah, um, and also when you're tracking cameras for these kind of virtual sets and augmented reality graphics, there's a whole lot more you need to track as well. It's not just position and rotation. You mm -hmm. also need to uh, you also need to track field of view and aperture and lots of lens data as well that you need to map onto your virtual camera and that's mm. um and those solutions are also still really important and uh, necessary when you're doing this kind of camera based um mm -hmm. virtual production stuff i see and that would be then less the marker based but more like data sync of the camera set yeah so you so you will literally um if you're if you're working in broadcast mm -hmm. most of the broadcast lenses will have literally just a port Mm -hmm. on them that they will send lens mm -hmm. data out of yeah. um but for what well, the ones that don't you will literally attach a motor to mm -hmm. the side of your lens and as the zoom and focus spins mm -hmm. it will send the data to where it needs to go and then there's a very laborious calibration process where mm -hmm. you teach the system what it means to be at full zoom and what mm -hmm. it means to be at like 0 0.75 focus and that kind of thing Oh, that makes a lot of sense. So yeah, so everyone that's sort of like tuning in. So now we know that, you know, there's a real camera and transfer all those real data camera settings into your virtual camera, which is exactly. in Unreal Engine. And then you get the exact field of view and everything. And so now you can sync the 3D and the real life to look exactly the same. That's really that's exactly it. That's really awesome. So um, we've got some questions in the chat as well. So yeah, definitely everyone, if you have any questions, burning questions, throw it in the chat. I yes. also want to yes. introduce Donna as well, who's one of our course yes. advisors. So Hi, she's going to be referring your questions to our guests as well. So Donna, do you have some questions from the audience? Look, Aidan, there's been a lot of questions about your setup, <laughs> as you can imagine. Yeah, I... Um... <laughs> sorry, sorry, Hugh, but it's more interesting than you. <laughs> of course, of course. 
Yeah, if you could talk us through it, like I guess how you've created this setup and also how much you've invested into this setup as well. That seems to be what the discussion seems how, to how, be. How much that. it is is <laughs> yeah, usually a common question. When I put that camera, oh, I put it back. Expensive, so, I'm guessing. Expensive, yes. yes. Each yes. of these little cameras. Um, so this is an OptiTrack Flex 13 camera. It is a 2K camera, so just a little bigger than 1080p. Um, and resolution isn't actually a big deal for mocap. Um, just the way, basically, the software will see a market and then work out how big it is. And so it doesn't actually really need many pixels to do that. It is what's called a global shutter camera. Um, that means, so your cameras, if you ever filmed out of a car while it's moving, everything sort of slants to the side. That's because it starts at the top of the sensor and works its way down when it captures a frame of data. Um, a global shutter takes an entire frame at once because you don't really want that skewing to happen when you're doing mocap because these, these cameras can run up to 360 frames per second, um, especially if you're doing sports size stuff. Uh, each one of these puppies is one and a half thousand US dollars um, and you need at least four to track a rigid object or at least six to track a human. Um, and then the software is even more than that which I'm still very upset about. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's 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 very simple you know you just put them up uh, you actually just put them up randomly. Um, they have an FOV so you sort of plan out this is the area I want to track so I'm gonna have one here one here one here one here. Um, then we have do I have one lying around here it is. Uh, so there's a rigorous calibration process so I've got to wave a <laughs> wand around. It's, Again, expensive because everything is expensive. Um, mm. So you wave that around and what that does is that lets the cameras, because it's a set dimension, so it's that each ball is 250 mil from each other um, and the camera uh, software knows that. So as you wave that around, the cameras will work out where they are in relation to each other. So they'll figure out, oh, that camera's over there because it sees the ball here and I see it here. So I must be here and it must be there. Um, and so that process, and then you calibrate the center point and then it's done and it's it's so accurate. And, you know, it's at the moment, the way I have it set up, I think it's a 0 0.1 millimeter accuracy. So when it says a ball's here in 3D space, it's 0 0.1 millimeter accurate. <laughs> So um, but yeah, uh, but also that being said, that is a OptiTrack is a broadcast quality solution. Yes, that's the beauty. This isn't, the, um, <laughs> this isn't for Joe Joe Blow at home. This is the, the the beauty. The beauty about virtual production is that if you really want to, you can get maybe not exactly the result of the examples that we've shown, but you can get something pretty damn close. Uh, using Vive Wands and a GoPro. Like um, Unreal Engine is free to download. Um, and if you have the knowledge, you can start experimenting with it. You can start using Vive trackers, which go for a couple of hundred, like, yeah, a couple of hundred bucks a there piece. There we go. So these are a hundred bucks work with, you know, um, HTC Vive and uh, the Steam one, um, the Valve Index, that's what it's called. Um, and these are not as accurate. Um, they have a jitter problem, but for learning purposes, that's a hundred bucks compared to one and a half US each. So it, you, there's quite a lot you can do and everything I showed you with the camera tracking, you can do with this. Um, you can even do it, Epic has an app for your mobile phone uh, to use the AR capabilities of your iPhone to do it. So from a learning perspective, you do not need to blow this much money. <laughs> mm -hmm. And essentially, Aiden, what you're saying is all the coolest tech can also be obtained tax claimed by tax as well because it's also in the other profession yes <laughs> yeah so you get all the cool toys so um that's so yeah, cool but... so look i have another question i'm just sort of reading through the chat so sarah has mentioned are they are they pre-made assets as a vfx vfx artist do you model your assets too it can be either um, so at Giraffic, uh, because we work in broadcast, we do lots of stuff quickly. Uh, it entirely depends on the project that we've been given. Um, so sometimes we will, uh, it's a process called kit bashing, where you will take assets from the Unreal Marketplace, from online, adapt them for your purposes and do it really quickly. Or you can do it fully bespoke and start from scratch and make things from scratch. I think Victor would be able to speak more on that as well. You can see by my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, that's uh, what, what you said is exactly that. You have the uh, benefit of using Unreal Environment where you have the entire uh, marketplace library 
that you can hit bash uh, everything and most of the time when you blocking stuff with 80 percent there and then you can come down to okay we want a custom set design that, that's become uh entirely separate creation right uh, that with the pipeline we're going to they want to have branding they want to have a big statue uh inside the stadium they want the entire new stadium that never exists before then it become a uh, job by uh with the company with the wrong history and the uh experience that we got for all the work that we've done so far most of the digital apps that we can reuse we can modify uh, and then adapt it to the new work that we need to So uh, in terms of asset uh, that you create, you would go in similar pipeline that you would do for film, similar pipeline that you would do for uh, game, but there is a two side of the spectrum that you need to uh, aware because we are working with the uh, real footage, real uh, live camera, uh, the people that you're working with need to come in with the uh, digital asset. So those digital assets need to look real. It needs to look like it's in the same space. You immerse yourself in, in, in that virtual world. It needs to look realistic, but at the same time, it needs to be optimized enough that it is be able to run real time, right? So you need to kind of have to have this on both. Yeah. And that's where people transition. We have, we have people transition from uh, game asset side, working in video game before, now we need to upskill to make a more realistic asset. And some people uh, come from the film industry that now need to create asset that is much more optimized than what you would do in traditional film pipeline. And speaking of assets, because like you'd know this best vector, because, you know, as, you know, students studying from AIT, we do a lot of 3D models and, you know, characters is always something that's really awesome to do, right? And obviously, we... <laughs> We grow up making a lot of cool characters, but seeing graphics work, right? It's often like more environmentally based and then sort of like solid structures. And yep. so coming from like a portfolio's perspective, like if like a student studying 3D wants to sort of get into this space, what sort of like a portfolio piece do you look for more when hiring, like let's say for a junior position? It's actually much more fundamental than the subject matter that you show. Uh, if you do the character work and the character look good, go for realism and it look realistic. That's it, right? So you do a surface model. It's not too far from that. And when you work on the character, character is a good example because you need to really pay attention to detail for the entire character for to to look good character have props character have some sometimes wearing armor and all of that which is not an organic element of them if you do it well you do it realistic so it's more on the quality rather than uh the subject matter that that you have it would be good if you have something that okay catered to what we're trying to do we can see it we can judge it right away Right. But if you show the skill that, hey, you're paying attention, this is how it integrates to the scene. I have a character. Can your character run in the virtual environment, drop it in Unreal Scene? You know how to uh, adjust the texture, the shader to, to make, make sure it works. Your character have a different prop uh, that looks the way that it's supposed to look is the more important part than the technical detail of what it is organic hard surface. Uh, you kind of need to be be able to adapt to both. Yeah. Um, I'll throw it back to Donna again. If yeah, I've got a couple here. <laughs> so Victor, I'm going to catch you again. Um, so can you talk to us about what it has taken for you to get into the industry? Because it seems like you've obviously moved into the industry quite quickly. So talk to us a little bit about your journey. Uh, okay, so yeah, I studied two years in AIT on Bachelor of Interactive Media. I was specialized in animation. Uh, it just what trend on, and this is not yeah, to anyone. Uh, it's what you learn outside of school that's matter, right? Uh, doesn't matter uh, what school, you, what course you do. Uh, it can only give you the understanding of the basic 
uh, give you an entry point where you could learn things, especially nowadays uh, in this industry where new, uh, where you have a new software, new workflow coming in all the time. So you need to be able to up to date. Uh, when how my transition to the industry was pretty straightforward. I'm not looking to create uh, work that I was studying. I look into the industry on what they need and I start learning that. Right. So setting up your goal, where do you want to go? Uh, back then was doing, okay, getting a job. I want to be a character artist. I want to do uh, really cool stuff. Love and wear engine. I want to work on asset. VR was on the rise. So the first group company that I was working for was uh, VR company. And so I started creating asset that work uh, in real time and looks really good because when you go into a virtual environment, they want to see digital double of the real world. So I need to create uh, everything as close to uh, real world as much as possible. The only engine that's uh, be able to kind of do that at the time was Unreal, still kind of do. So that's how my transition going in there. Be able to look into market trend and look at what industry need from you as a practitioner. Uh, that's how I got it. Mm. And that's really a good point cool. as well well because like sometimes I always they tell the students you know how do employers know you are passionate about something because we're, we're people want to hire people that are passionate right and what is passion passion is often the things you do outside of school right a lot of graduates coming and showcasing the school work and everyone's got school work but then the person that shows the stuff that's outside of school is that like, oh wow that guy's extra passionate right and then that really then defines you know that extra oomph to your passion in the field. So that's a good point, Victor. Um, yeah, Adana, let's keep going through those questions. Yeah, I've got a couple more here. So look, I'm gonna combine one. Daniel asked a bit of a question and Oscar as well. And I think they mold together well. So what's the normal team size for one of the projects that you work on and collaborate with? And I guess how long would a average project take? Yeah entirely depends upon the clients and entirely depends on the scope of their wishes like some clients want a single ar billboard and so you give one artist three days to do it then you send one engineer um, on site to do it then you have cases like the australian elections where we had to fly in our entire overseas company we needed like four engineers like seven different places and the entire company's art department was making election graphics for the recent uh, federal election. And so, yeah, it scales, um, but currently our full Unreal team is about five or six people. Um, and so we're doing the grunt of the Unreal work. And, and then we have, um, yeah. Hugh, how big's the asset team? Uh, the asset team is less than that. So- Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oops. Uh, oh, one of the- um, the other side of the team is uh, we have designers and other 3D artists, which is about uh, another six or seven people. Um, but yeah, so we're quite a small and growing company. Um, but yes, the um, general turnaround is our projects tend to go in the scale of singular months rather than multiple months. Um, but the, there is room on either side to have bigger projects that take multiple months to engineer and test yep. and then implement and other sides of the coins where you have a week in a single camera. So you've got to just go for it. Um, and that's sort of like broadcast as a whole, um, because we have to have that flexibility. Just to give a little bit of uh, context, why we have to do headcount about our own company. As well. Uh, so Giraffe, uh, right now we have about uh, 40 people, uh, 40 employee working, but we are in, uh, right now we're in five different countries. Uh, you and I are here in Sydney, uh, Aden in Brisbane, and then we also have office in the US, uh, in South America, in, in Chile, Argentina, and in London. Um, so the asset team is pretty much uh, scattered across the world. <laughs> I have two uh, asset team web uh, 3D journalists here in Sydney with me, two of them. Uh, I have one in Denver, 
uh, one in Argentina and the other one in Chile. So that's uh, the way that how everything works right now. Uh, mm. Not not because like we like to be remote, uh, but we need to be able to cater for uh, most of our clients in a different part of the world. And that's how it is, and that shows you the nature of work that you can do nowadays as well. Uh, that you don't have to be location bound anymore. Yeah. And so having done all these projects with all these international clients and gone through like many projects, is there like a particular role that has always been like, oh, we, we, need, that, we need that type of person a lot, right? You know, maybe it's the asset team, maybe it's the tech team, like they're like in these specific role that's sort of like in demand right now? I think right now, nowadays for most of the company, uh, studio are now breaking down into much smaller studio like Jurassic and mm -hmm. able to do big work. So uh, I think general list is a skill that we need. Mm -hmm. the, uh, most of the skill, like three of us, we all do a whole bunch of different things. In the and that's come down to what, yeah, when, when we said how many people per uh, project, uh, that's feel animation work here that uh, some of us will just be soloing that work from start to finish, concept modeling, texturing, animation, render out, set to client, and done. And some, some of the project, yeah, you do uh, a little bit more uh, focused work, uh, be, being a specialist. But right now, I think for most of the company, even larger company like VFX Health, like ILM, and now available for more generalist work where you can uh, uh, take care a little bit more of the responsibility to to different things because now software is a lot better now. You don't have to wait for the production chain uh, for it to come come to you. You can be able to jump in different things. So skill and position that we need uh, generalists and inside that generalist is problem solving. That's the most uh, important skill that we're uh, looking for. Of most of the people coming in. Hmm. And that's good to know, right? So for anyone that's studying 3D or planning to study 3D, you know, 3D has a lot of things ranging from the 3D art modeling, then obviously Victor's mentioned the texturing, be decent at animating, be decent at, you know, lighting and just knowing abroad of everything that how it operates in 3D definitely comes into usefulness down the line because it seems like generalist is... You know, it's in again, so especially for the, the yeah, the smaller companies. So, um, um, Donna, well, you have not more many more questions. Uh -huh. Be quiet. So I will I've, add yeah. though, it is recorded the session, Oscar. Mm -hmm. Whilst we're at it, <laughs> yeah. so our sessions are recorded, and we actually will share them after for everybody that registered. And usually they go on. <laughs> Awesome. I just had a question because I noticed Tim is in the house. So Tim comes from more uh, film side of things and you guys do a lot of broadcasts and 3D and digital. But what about from a film perspective, like working with the film crew or do you guys have a film crew? And what's like the, like, the process of like, you know, obviously you got your effects and tech all sorted, but then working with the film side of things, how does that all work? We don't do a huge amount of film work. Um, because we have, we are born and bred in live TV. Oh, I mean like do... the camera side, the camera side of things. Oh, yes. Mm. Um, the big hotness in film at the moment is the LED volume, uh, which you've probably heard about from ILM. They used for The Mandalorian. Mm -hmm. uh, they are pitching it as a replacement for green screen, where instead of having green behind your presenter, you mm -hmm. have an LED wall that is running a live Unreal Engine instance that has your virtual backdrop inside of it so that you see basically the final output of your visual composite right through the camera. Um, and the, the technology train is actually very similar. Um, it just It's a tracked camera going into Unreal. The only difference is that you then have another layer of programs, which mm -hmm. then take your output and warp and project it onto these LED walls mm -hmm. so that it looks right in perspective from the camera's point of view. Um, if I may add to that, so I've actually, I've worked on two features and three TVCs on LED wall prior to Graphic. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's an interesting thing and it has its own... Um, problems um, especially if you've heard of moray um, mainly because a camera sensors 
squares, uh, pixels, and a LED wall happens to be squares. So mm -hmm. what you end up with is sort of this weird pattern. I don't know if you ever tried to take a photo of your computer monitor. Um, that's probably the biggest issue. Um, another thing is with focus, because um, although it looks like on your LED set, it's like something way, way in the distance, you can't actually pull focus to that because it's not way, way in the distance. It's actually right here. Um, so focus is another thing where it's sort of, you got to start to do a, focus, a rack focus and then hand that over to a virtual focus pull to do the rest of it to get it um, married up so um, it's quite an interesting um, thing I don't think it's quite as good as everyone's been saying but everyone is definitely trying to use it for everything um, and it's got its own set of problems which thankfully we don't really have to deal with um, <laughs> here at Graphic. Um, but it's it's an interesting thing and there's quite a lot of them popping up here in Australia um, not just I ILM's got one but there's heaps of others around um, and it's 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 uh it's definitely a career path if you wanted to go down that as well but again that's mostly um sort of environment based um 3d work so uh mm -hmm. you know whether it's big landscapes or cities or anything like that um so if you're sort of wanting to get down that you either focus on environments or focus on the tech behind it but uh except with the exception of ilm it all runs in unreal as well so you can download it free uh, if you've got one of these vive trackers um, or if you happen to own an opti track um, you can do it with a tv or something if you really wanted to learn it um uh anyone that's curious ilm uses a program called helios now uh and they have a one server of a machine per 500 by 500 pixel square uh, so they have thousands of computers to render their uh, giant led wall wow so yeah there you go everyone it's a huge eye opener especially on something that's you know very cutting edge right now so hopefully this gives everyone a good insight into what's happening now in the digital space right if you're going into 3d you know you would thought you know making 3d models but behind the scenes how it gets applied obviously from a virtual production side you can use your environments and you know use some tv and live broadcast and then through technical art that's now we can now sync the cameras and if you sync the cameras and we got leds and green screens you know real life and 3d are now being merged together and that's just been one of the really good practical uses of 3d and how you would one of the options of working in the 3D industry, if you choose to sort of pursue that path. So really appreciate you all, Aiden and Hugh and Victor for sharing your insights. Hopefully everyone got something really cool out of tonight. And I just want to, you know, say thank you on behalf of, you know, everyone here as well. So um, I'm going to send you guys off, but before everyone goes off, we still have one more quick special talk. And then we've got Daniel, who's also with us today. And he's going to talk a little bit about what's it like studying 3D, especially AIT. And then, you know, we, we're going to talk you through a little bit about our course as well and what you would do if you were to study 3D at AIT. So I'm going to put Daniel in a sec to come on. But before I do that, I just want to send off um, our special guests today. And thank you guys one more time, Hugh, Aiden, and Victor for taking your time tonight to share with us um, yeah, the world of 3D and what you do at Giraffic. And so Giraffic is in Surrey Hills, yeah? Yeah, we in Australia. Right. And so, you know, our local Sydney peeps. So for those who are in Sydney, you know, there's a lot of cool studios around. And then Giraffic is in uh, Surrey Hills as well, so near the city. So, but um, yeah, thank you so much once again for sharing us your insight. And then, um, yeah, feel free to head off. Thank you. And then... yes. <laughs> guys. Thank you so much you. again. But what I'm going to do, we're going to continue on with um, Daniel. So we're going to bring uh, Daniel on board. So Daniel has also studied a bit with AIT as well. And he's going to share with you a little bit about you know, his experiences as well as what's it like to um, study 3D at AIT. So welcome, Daniel. Well, thank you. Um... Hello everyone, my name is Daniel and I'm one of the student enrollment advisors at AIT in Melbourne, as well as a current 3D student myself. I'm going to give you a rundown of our 3D design course. Now Donna is on the live chat now and she'll also come on at the end if you have any questions and if you have any technical questions, they'll be answered in a Q&A later on. 
So for over 20 years, AIT has delivered progressive education that helps to place graduates in successful roles in the creative, digital media and tech industries. So what we do best is cultivate students' passions and their unique artistic style, whilst also providing regular opportunities to connect with the industry. Now, currently, we have two campuses in both Sydney and Melbourne, offering courses in film, animation, 3D design, game design, and mobile app development. So our education gives you the foundation of what you need to know in the industry. You'll learn the theory, get trained on the tools, and learn a diverse range of skills relevant to the industry. You'll receive real-world training as well through our industry preparation programs. And we also have technical training in software such as Autodesk, Maya, 3D Studio Max, and Mudbox for our 3D modeling and rigging. We use Pixelic ZBrush for digital sculpting, Adobe Creative Suite and Substance Painter for texture creation, as well as Unreal Game Engine to integrate 3D with games. So our next intake is in September, and we have three trimesters per year, which is May, September, and February, as you can see. We are back on campus with face-to-face -face classes, but all our classes are live streamed as well if you cannot make it to class, and they are recorded in case you miss one, so you don't need to stress at all about any of that. So how it all works, the diploma goes for a year, associate degree will be two years, and then the bachelor is three years. So if you apply for the bachelor, but you get stressed, and even if you do drop out after finishing the second year or so, you're still walking out with something, essentially. So you can do the accelerated, which is four subjects per trimester, but the general standard is two to three subjects per trimester, which is about four hours per subject per week, with three hour classes plus one hour self-study. I will now pass this back on to Carlton so he can explain a little bit about our 3D course. Hmm. Anyway, so uh, yeah, this is our 3D course. Uh, if you ever get our sort of booklet, this is sort of the progression that of subjects that you'll study at AIT. Yep. Uh, oh, oh, can you keep that slide up? <laughs> I need that slide. Oh, keep that slide up. <laughs> I wasn't yeah. sure if you were showing one then. Yeah, I oh, know. There just, you go. <laughs> I'll just use those like. Hmm. So throughout our three D interactive media degree, so there's a three year degree, and so you learn a lot of things ranging from, you know, uh, it's interactive media, right? And so not only do you need to know three D, but there's a lot of things outside three D as well that is sort of essential skills as well. Like let's say, for example, we've got things like video editing, which obviously as a three D modeler, you need to showcase your thing in video one day, and then. Um, Ideally, you need those uh, video editing skills. We got digital storytelling, like telling stories and then like drawing. Those are all essential skills. And then you see digital audio. So there's a lot of essential skills in the digital media space that you will learn throughout our degree. But focusing on the 3D side of things, um, you can see on the right hand side, we've got intro to 3D, we got animation, we got modeling, we got advanced modeling and advanced animation. And so essentially throughout your sort of path at AIT, you'll sort of learn two sides. You'll learn the modeling side, so making 3D models, such as your 3D characters. We also have some electives and you can sort of like model 3D props and model 3D environments and basically become a proficient 3D modeler, right? And that goes to like characters, texturing, rigging, right? And so all these things that might sound a bit weird if like if it's the first time hearing in the 3D. But yeah, these are how 3D sort of works in terms of in the back end. And so that's the modeling side. We, as like Daniel said, there's a lot of tools from Maya, Substance, ZBrush, right? These are the industry tools right now that is being used to create 3D models. And then you can use that through either games or as you saw from our guest speakers, they work more in a film environment, live broadcast, right? And then you got animation. So animating and telling your own stories that like you get your character that you modeled and you create some character animations and through that character animation also like create a short animation as well using whatever 
like the story that you want to tell. So, and that's in advanced animation subjects, right? Ultimately, once you learn how to model and once you learn how to animate, it takes you to the forge. So the forge at the very end is your final project. So once you're very proficient in your skills in 3D, you can then, you know, all this has been individual work up till now. And then towards the final semester, you join up in a group with other students in different fields and you get to work with like the film people maybe so sometimes you can work on 3d for a film and sometimes a 3d team also works for a game team as well we've got game students and they make 3d for a game like right now the 3d team for the current forge is working on an egyptian action game so the 3d team is making this like egyptian temple environment whilst the game programmers are doing their pro game programming thing, right? And so yeah, your 3D skills can be going into games or film, or as well as creating a short animation as well in 3D, right? And so joining up with other 3D buddies and creating a nice short 3D animation. And at the end of it, hopefully you should be pretty proficient in how 3D works. So yeah, that's a little bit of um, what it's like in your three year journey if you were studying at a 3D at AIT. Back to you, Daniel. Thank you. So at the start, I myself, I had no clue what I wanted to do. I started off going into the game design course. And then after the first trimester, I was like, no, I don't want to do game design. I'm enjoying 3D more. So the transition to actually change over is pretty easy as well, which is pretty good. And I did find 3D very hard at the start. I'm not going to lie. It is difficult. But now that I'm in my third year, it is so much fun and I am loving it. <laughs> and as discussed earlier, our intakes are in September, February and May. So I'm pretty sure they generally run around the start. Yeah, around start, middle sort of area is when the intakes usually run. But... Yeah, that, that's pretty much it on the intakes. Now, we do also happen to have an open day coming up. So please do sign up and come check the campus out. You get free pizza, free drinks, check out the campus. You can see our green screen room. You can even see some students' projects and how the classes are run. So it is very entertaining and interesting. So you can also apply through our website now if you wanted to by going to ait.edu.au forward slash apply now. But international students can just email us. And a good benefit about AIT as well, there is no ATAR requirement. So just HSC completion or Cert 4 or diploma. So on this slide, as you can see, it has myself and Donna, who are Melbourne Enrollment Advisors. Charlotte is the Sydney Enrollment Advisor, and then Thais is International. Uh, I'll now pass it back to Donna and Carlton, but thank you all for listening. Uh, thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you, that was good. So Daniel, I, I've got a question for you because the chat is obviously really quiet. <laughs> yeah. And I'd like to understand, I guess, from obviously when you were looking for a course to study before you enrolled with AIT, why you chose AIT? Um, the whole structure of AIT to me, it's just so much cleaner. It's so much nicer and you can accidentally make friends. You will talk to everyone. The rooms, like some of the rooms, the classrooms and everything, they are bigger, but a lot of the common spaces are close together. So you will accidentally make friends with like first years, second years, third years. It doesn't matter. And everyone's always willing to help. And also a lot of our teachers have actually done some amazing projects in the past and present so that is also very exciting <laughs> yeah that's awesome i know you're in the middle of forge right now too can you talk to us a little bit about your journey with forge uh so at the start we me and my group we sort of had no clue what we wanted to do 
and we weren't sure what we were going to name our company. We played around with many different ideas. I designed up the logos and I've been doing all the marketing and everything as well as some concept arts. But I haven't been focusing on a bunch of the main modeling because I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll do the marketing. I'll do the marketing. I sometimes, at some points, I regret doing the marketing because it does take a lot. <laughs> Setting up all the socials, the website, but it is really fun and it is an awesome experience because you get to essentially work with other majors to come up with an industry standard project in the Forge 1. And then in the Forge 2, you have 12 more weeks to finish up that project to then present to industry panels, which is really exciting. Mm, and to bring yeah. context as well, it's just what's been marketing, because that's one really cool thing about the Forge as well. Like at the end of the three-year journey, once you sort of, you know, learn everything, now you're working as a group, making a game, making a film, making an animation. But not only that, you know, the next step is to also working on your branding and your socials and exposure, because that's also an important skill set as well, because you make it, but then you need an audience to sort of like know about it, right? And so part of the forge is also practicing that whole marketing aspect, which you're now doing now, Daniel. And then, yeah, because all these are essential skills as well. So. Yeah, really good. We've just had a really great comment from Rory. Mm -hmm. The workflow curriculum staff assistants, that would be you, Carlton, <laughs> one of the staff, mm -hmm. um, and teachers have all been fantastic at AIT. And this is coming from someone who began his degree at the start of the pandemic. So that's so mm -hmm. nice. It's so <laughs> nice to be here. And look, going forward, obviously the pandemic had changed a lot of things for a lot of universities and for a lot of people for what they're looking for in how they learn. And what's great with our course is you do have the ability to do a bit of a blended model of learning so you could complete some units online. And personally, you would feel like even though you're at home and you're online, you feel like you're in the classroom. We have technology that follows the teacher around the room. You feel like you're there. A lot of students, they love to do full-time face-to-face, so we cater for that as well. So you've definitely got flexibility in regards to how you take on your study as well. Is there any other questions out there? Quiet tonight. I just realized you have the coolest hairdo, Donna. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it keeps like waving in and out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank the you. pandemic was quite technical, though. I struggled at the start. I'm not going to lie, because the pandemic was just, it was painful. But the whole sort of process with the hybrid learning experience, it did help a lot. But I still did find it better personally going into campus to be able to speak to teachers and get help. But having that hybrid learning experience is actually a better opportunity because someone could end up with like COVID or something nowadays and they won't be able to make it into class in person so they can still jump online. They don't miss anything, which is really good. Exactly. Hmm. And it sets you up for industry as everybody's just seen tonight. Obviously, yeah. for a lot of people in industry, there's that hybrid model of working. Um, so I think, you know, there's definitely been a lot of silver lining, even though it was hard to sort of obviously gravitate in the beginning. It was all a very new world for us. But it does Most definitely, definitely. Yeah, it sets you up for mm -hmm. industry for sure. It's all that problem solving and that, you know, being apart and working more together and creating more of that team effort. Like it definitely helps you for industry and I'm sure Carlton would agree on that too mm, and something that you know and this is only recent throughout the pandemic these past two three years is that we shifted onto online we shifted onto you know um starting recording all the sessions and now you know like Daniel like you said like the benefits of having every session recorded even if you do miss certain classes that all the recordings are available to re-watch the replays and Having said that, we also notice a huge boost in everyone's learning as well, because then they can like watch it back as well. Because, you know, traditional classes, you sort of watch it and then like, like, what do you say again in that certain section? But now you can watch it back. And we realize that as teachers anyway, the students away are able to pull off much more better work because now they can like go back to the certain things that they've missed. So that has been like a huge game changer, the uh, video recordings that we do nowadays as well. So, well, 
I got one more thing to say. When mm-hmm. I had you as a teacher, Carlton, uh-huh. you almost uh-huh. gave me a heart attack with uh-huh. finding a grade because <laughs> I kept looking back on the grade and I even questioned it when you gave me that 99 mm-hmm. out of 100. Uh, yeah. I, I was like, nah, something don't seem right. And <laughs> yeah, you were like, nah, it's right. You, you kept uh-huh. watching the video playback again. And I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, I did. <laughs> uh, yeah that goes to show the, the good work that you've done to sort of achieve that mark right and so it's all well deserved as well so, yeah. so I, worked, that I, lost, I lost that Dan- i lost daniel to 3d <laughs> like, you imagine yeah. in the game side so though i would have yeah. got you on the games so. mm. did and another thing we can probably touch on whilst we're at it is the internships that we offer throughout the course i don't know if you want to touch on that carlton or should i Oh, yeah, I can go through internships because, yeah. yeah, towards the final year, we also have the internship subject as well. So part of, you know, our mission at AIT is also to connect our students with industry, right? And so we have the internship program so everyone can apply for it. Obviously, you know, we want to make sure the students are well prepared and well equipped with their skill set. And so we do have like a screening process. And then, but once we do that, we try to like push all our students and connect them with all the connected companies that we know of and you know possibly after tonight you know connect with giraffic as well and maybe throw some students their way as well but yeah that's what at the end of the day you know we're teaching but our ultimate mission is to get you guys into the industry and to start off we got like all the we got other events as well but we also have like to try to like bring industry talks but at the same time we also um try to like push our students and connect them up by helping them out with the internship as well and that has led to a lot of our student success working in industry through that internship program Mm. yeah it's a very valuable opportunity and and just to sort of recap on what daniel said before too being that smaller more intimate environment a lot of people really excel in this course for that reason i mean you you could you've got access to your teachers such as carlton you know if you're ever a little bit stuck on something you've got that assistance right throughout the course so it's a very different sort of environment versus a big university feel so we definitely recommend come check out our open day saturday the 13th of august it's going to be very exciting it's a great opportunity for you to see our facilities meet some of our students see some of their work that they're producing meet the teachers have something to eat it will be running yeah exactly that too it will be running from 10 a.m until 1 p.m so definitely make sure to register we would love to have you all yeah so is there any other questions before we finish up today it's very quiet any questions about the course doesn't look like it yeah, otherwise, definitely check out our campus. We, it's newly painted and it's got new tech, new computers as well. So, yeah, it's worth checking out now. We've got cool, like these cool Alienware computers. Yeah, the really Alienware. Cool. <laughs> I was about to say that. Uh-huh. All updated. And yeah, and we're trying to get that throughout everywhere as well, the new computers. So, when by the time you guys join, you, you guys would be very lucky because you guys get the, the latest tech. So. And the Oculus yeah. Quest 2s. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yep. In the games room, hmm. which Daniel can definitely talk about. Oh, I, I love the games room. I'm, I'm glad mm-hmm. that it was a thing that started. <laughs> we, like a bunch of friends and myself, we all decided, oh, we should just start making up groups and see if AIT approves of it. So that's also another good thing with AIT. You can say, hey, I want to make up this group. And then AIT pretty much gives you a chance to work with it so so far we have magic mondays where you play magic the gathering all day then there's vr tuesdays where you get to play the oculus all day and there's even a dungeons and dragons group starting up as well i'm not sure what day that's going to be but it's definitely starting up yeah Um, yeah both on the sydney and melbourne campus for that one yeah yeah it's so cool well, I think we might finish up. It's um, very mm. quiet. We don't have many questions. That's good. I'll see you, pop- you in Forge, Daniel. <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah, you're doing oh, a talk yes. in Forge, Donna. <laughs> yeah. so, could oh, you pop I the, got a uh, Forge talk tomorrow. <laughs> could you pop the info session link back on the chat once more, Donna? And then we'll probably yeah, finish off. So, yeah, so click the link to sort of like, 
yeah, come book a time during that open day and then come check us out if you're free and interested. We're based in our Ultimo, Kelly Street, and so in Sydney. So, and we also have a Melbourne campus as well in Brisbane. So, um, yeah, excited to see you all. But otherwise, just want to wrap up by hopefully everyone got some valuable information today, tonight in terms of the world of 3D, right? And then, yeah, and I think our guest speakers uh you know awesome and then shared with us some really cutting edge stuff which uh hopefully was an eye opener it was an eye opener to most of us as well so it was really cool so yeah otherwise yeah thank you once again and um hope to catch you all soon maybe on open day but until then thank you thank you and thank you everybody Daniel mm -hmm. no worries thank you thank you